Hello, I'm Lauren and welcome to Improving the World. I'm an international improviser based in Hong Kong and I speak with amazing women who improvise all over the world. Today, the virtual background is hitting my hair and parts of my head are disappearing at random. So let's see how this goes. I speak with Gosia Rosowska. She is in Gdansk, Poland, and we talk about the character depth that can be achieved when you look at it through the film lens. I hope that you enjoy. You are an improviser. You travel around, especially in Europe, teaching and doing improv and doing collaborations. But what we're going to talk about today is the fact that you have a background in both cultural studies and in film. Improv through your vision, through your lens, and especially with film as a focus. Talk to me first about your background and how that has influenced how you see characters and character depth. I was doing improv before I went to film school, so I was implementing right away what I was learning while learning directing. Yeah. And what I learned is that we look at the characters in improv in a shallow way. We go with yes ending. First of all, we forget that people can be different and we don't have to be the same. And while agreeing, we don't have to turn into the same person and drop our personality mm -hmm. as a performer and as a character. The other thing is that we tend to take the suggestion and improv literally and very straight. So when mm -hmm. we are playing a plumber, we are starting to do what plumbers do at work. And what directing and screenwriting taught me is that we are not what we do. We are who we are. It's not our occupation that defines us. Mm. Of course, it influences us mm. and makes us do things that we do, but it's not who we are. In film, when we watch a film, we see that the characters are just deeper. And why is that? It's because they always have this human layer. In improv, we are making a lot of shortcuts to just fulfill the audience suggestion, for example. And then we play all the characters that are the same all the time. We see the same policeman for thousand times in improv. I read somewhere that improv can be anything, so why is it always the same? How then did doing a master's within cultural studies influence you? Did that add more depth to how you thought about improvising characters? A bit connected and a bit different because while learning about human cultures, I started learning about our little differences in the way we think and more in the way we act. We are implemented by the cultures that we live in. We cannot totally separate ourselves from it. And there's nothing wrong about it. It's fine to be different. We all have the same needs and drives again as humans, but we just operate differently. There is no good or wrong way because something that for me is weird for you will be totally normal everyday activity. While traveling with improv, I love asking tons of questions to people from where I go about their lives and not only how they do improv because who we are shows on stage. If I play something, even an everyday activity, and you think, ah, oh, there's something strange about it. Maybe it's because it's just where I come from. We do it differently than you do. Improv is a wonderful way and tool to connect people on this human level while also letting them be who they are and showing how they behave and operate. I'm a part of the European International Ohana group. There are people from most of the countries from Europe. I'm always laughing. Even there, you can see that people who are all improvisers, so we have the same level of improvness and openness in us. But still, friends from Finland, they can just instinctively take a step back when they talk to you because you just came too close. <laughs> or a friend from Amsterdam, because we are bringing some things from our countries just to share, like chocolates or mm. hazelnut vodka from Poland. She brought like sugar sprinkles that we would just put on a cake 
mm. or an ice cream and then she put it on her bread uh, as a sandwich and we we're like what is that why are you putting sugar on your bread and she's Sorry, like Dutch people i'm definitely questioning this choice <laughs> And I was just like, what are you doing? And she's like, you're not going to destroy it for me. And she was just like, we eat it like that. And she's like, sugar, drink your own bread. And she's like, yeah, we don't care about our food. And then Greeks are, you know, outrageous. So <laughs> The statement Greeks are outrageous. I like what you said. It's about the intricacies. You're so right. What defines culture? It's also for me what defines something interesting on stage. As you said, seeing the same policeman... 20 times is less interesting than seeing that individual on a different day. Why are we watching theater, right? When we're not watching for the average, we're watching for that odd day or that odd moment. We're finding the little differences and that's what we're broadcasting and showing. I think that that's lovely. Yes, but on the other hand, there are two aspects of that because on the one hand, we want to see something that is extraordinary but also we need to connect to this person that we're watching. Otherwise, it will be a concept that is unrealistic. And if something is too perfect, for example, we feel it's fake and we will not connect. It's showing the extraordinary, but finding human in everyone to connect through this aspect of being humans. How do you think we get beyond concept or a caricature into character, the depth that is needed to truly display a 3D character. I mean, we live in a world of AI, 4D character, I don't know. It's again about being humans, like you said about the policemen. When we watch a film about detectives or policemen in an action movie, it's not like you see them all the time doing police stuff and shooting in the air. Do you I see love them go you think that that's police stuff. Boo, 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 boo. <laughs> yeah. I was like, we don't own guns in Poland, you know. <laughs> that's, I can tell you, that's, that's yeah, primarily I, what they do. I didn't want to say shoot people, so I said it in the air. <laughs> air shooting and people shooting, that's the most of the job is shooting, yeah. <laughs> I think. And eating donuts. This is something that you can see in improv. We don't even have... The, it's a concept from American movies. Policemen are shooting guns and eating donuts. It's not like you see it on the streets, but then you are also influenced by the pop culture, not only the culture, but the pop culture that we all share. But also if we are talking about finding something real in a character, then we should add something to this pop cultural vision, like this latest Joker film. Joker from Batman is a big concept. And when you add a layer of vulnerability, then you have the latest film. I think I did not answer your question because I got driven into some depression. Like, I don't know. <laughs> oh, I think you could answer the question. And I enjoyed the air gun shooting, so I'm pretty happy. Uh, yeah, I think that the air gun shooting just <laughs> destroyed. <laughs> I am sorry, but I'm equally very delighted. I think we're getting there. Really, the core of it is about humanity. I heard you say that to have that depth, we have to have that humanity. So we're going beyond caricature, stereotype, that assumption in pop culture, and we're dropping into it because we're going outside of the norm and the routine. Do you think that improv and the improv rules that we have block us? I mean, we have this whole thing about leading and following. Do you feel that the rules of improv sometimes prevent us from really getting into character? Yes, definitely. We are avoiding a big part of uh, possibilities, how to build characters and the tension between them. Mm -hmm. Because we are taught from the lesson one to yes and, which is like great, of course. But on the other hand, treating it in a shallow way excludes all the possibilities of having a conflict between people, for example. And conflict is the forbidden word in improv quite often and not in films. If you look at that, you can have characters who don't want to be together, but we put them and we make them like Shrek and Donkey. If Shrek says, go away, Donkey says, no, I will stay. I like you. And in improv, the donkey would leave and say, yes, and I will close the door. Someone can say, yeah, but conflict, people fighting, it's boring. Absolutely. Yes, it is boring. But if we have people fighting over the things that is very important to them, and they just have a different angle of looking at it, they think 
they are both doing the right thing, then they can fight because it will show us the stakes. Quite often we are lowering the stakes because we are following the follower all the time and no one wants to make a bold decision because it's scary and because someone may not like it or maybe I will destroy someone else's idea. But on the other hand, really, we like when someone has a strong idea because it's inspiring. I don't agree that we always have to just follow and be equal. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are equal as improvisers, but the characters doesn't have to be equal. And it's Johnston's status concept. It's connected to that. If we have people who are not agreeing or who are not equal and we make it the tension between them then we will have the relationship that can be true and when we understand both sides then it's real and also with people who are doing things that are wrong they never think that they are doing things wrong sorry are you talking about an improviser being wrong or a character being wrong like an evil character i mean the bad characters let's say Mm -hmm. People are making mistakes and we don't have to be evil to make mistakes because we all make mistakes. We are making it shallow by playing the villains just being bad Mm. or just playing conflict, people screaming at each other. If we ask ourselves, this is a question that I ask like a million times in my classes is why is it important? Because if someone is fighting, we don't fight over things that are irrelevant We fight over things that we find important and we want to defend them. We want to achieve something that we believe in Mm -hmm. or something that we believe is right. Mm -hmm. And it's never just fighting for fighting because then it's about nothing and it's boring. I'm hearing you say really that there is a difference between player agreement or disagreement and character agreement or disagreement, that we can have players agree and support each other and yes and each other, and then we can have characters that disagree. So long as we are all agreed that we are choosing to go forward together and play together and disagree together, that is the yes and, it's that player agreement. I'm really hearing you talk about the depth of the humanity being connected to the depth of things that are real like arguments. If you're gonna argue about something, it better not be like, what flavor of coffee are we having? Cause that is a boring argument unless- Because it's not about the coffee. And that's the thing that they were telling us in the film school too. It's mm-hmm. never about the coffee. The coffee is just a reflection. There is a reflection in that coffee of our relationship. We don't get along somehow. I got angry about the coffee because I got angry that you don't listen to me because I asked you for a tea. Yeah. And I feel not loved because I feel that you don't care about me and here I feel hurt and that's my drive and not just because I told you to give me the coffee. So maybe what we're saying actually is that instead of just avoiding conflict, we want to find valuable conflict and furthermore chase valuable conflict, dig into it and see what's going on through the conflict to use that to find character depth and vice versa, to use character depth to deliver good disagreement. Yes, and the conflict doesn't have to be because it's a conflict in uh, dramaturgy terminology, not just between people. And we can have a conflict of two people against the world too. It doesn't have to be between people. It can be we are together in it. And the tension doesn't have to be between people because we may be perfect together. And that's wonderful. And then we can also watch these people who are perfect together And it's lovely, but at some point, something has to happen. And it doesn't have to happen between them. Mm. It can be that the world starts pushing. Mm. Something has to push. If we push the character like the world wants to destroy you, and then we see the struggle of the protagonist, then there is a story. If we see people who are together against all odds, then we have a conflict of a story. If everything is perfect all the time, there is no story. So we need something to happen. And we need the character to want something and not to just want and get it right away. We yeah. need to see someone who's struggling to achieve something, who's yeah. working for it yeah. and who's going over the obstacles to achieve yeah. something. And I will add in my own personal perspective on this that my favorite improv is when people are truly, truly improvising in the moment and are not forward thinking the story. So they're not thinking, 
how do I drag this struggle out for 20 minutes to do a good long form? Oh, I know, I'll make myself three hoops to jump through, but truly, truly are present tense so that maybe they solve it in the moment and then something else happens, or maybe they can't solve it. But this idea of sort of solutionizing for yourself and forward thinking is more aligned to me with a simplistic story or concept rather than this organic weaving of struggle, when it can organically weave itself to a place of struggle and you don't know how you're going to get out of it and then you wiggle out of it or don't. I mean, I love a bad ending too. Like, oh, and then she died. <laughs> Great. Okay, that's fine. It's quite fulfilling, right? The fact that we don't get out of it and, or, you know, I've ended in Prague where the world explodes or something. It's like, well, that's it, we're all dead. Yes, and sometimes people are asking like, what about this directing? We cannot think ahead. It's not about thinking ahead. It's about being conscious of how the stories look like and how people behave. Then we can just react in the moment in a truthful way. Then we can overcome the obstacles or not, and we can put ourselves in trouble, which is always a great idea. If you see the nice road and trouble, always go for trouble, not in life, but in improv, always go for trouble. Mm -hmm. I also see something that people in improv are scared to achieve the goal, mm -hmm. because if they're going somewhere, and getting in the car, most often they will not reach the point before the end of the show. Scared to achieve the goal because what next? The scene will end and we still have time. And it's not about it because if you're going to the desert island, it's not the goal. It's the goal of the moment. It's like every story divides into scenes. Every scene divides into beats. And it's just another beat of a story. And then we reach the goal that happens to be new beginning. And then we get into this desert island and then the story starts and not ends. And mm -hmm. it can always start. And if we were playing a long form about finding a treasure, great, find it. And then deal with the consequences of mm -hmm. finding it. What happened next? You're yes. smart. You should be an improv teacher. <laughs> I like what you're saying. I like what you're saying a lot. I will consider that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You have a workshop called The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. And there's an improv short form game called Good, Bad, and The Ugly, which is about doling out advice. What is your Good, Bad, Ugly workshop? And is it about advice? How does it work? It's about protagonist, antagonist, and the sidekick. And about this concept that we also don't use that often because what I said before, that we all feel equal and we feel that we should not be a main character because it would be rude. But sometimes the story needs a protagonist or a protagonist can be a group. So it's about the whole concept of protagonist and antagonist. You need antagonist for the protagonist to have the obstacles and the stakes. It doesn't have to be one person who's a villain because sometimes it's the world that pushes us and this is the antagonistic force. Or sometimes it's the mother who loves you too much and pushes you down. It's not just a villain. We need a protagonist, someone who will want something and go for this journey. We need the antagonist that will push them back or make it hard to get, mm. to raise the stakes. And we need sidekicks so that the ugly is usually a sidekick. We need that donkey for the Shrek to help him because mm. Shrek is weak. We are all weak. And in the hero's journey concept, there's always a failure on the way. At some point we die metaphorically or <laughs> literally and then we resurrect. We need help quite often. Sometimes there are stories about our inner journey, but most of the times we have Frodo and Frodo needs Sam to bring the ring to Mordor. And then we need Sauron because there's no Sauron. Why would they go on this journey? What are the stakes and why is it important again? We need to stop and talk about how you say the names of the characters of Lord of the Rings way more beautifully than I ever have heard in my life. Your accent is just... Rolling those R's. <gasps> I just need a minute because that was so good. <laughs> Woo! Whole Polish language stands on R's. It's R. It's always R. Like my name, Małgorzata Różalska. It's always R sure. somewhere. I don't know what you said, but... Okay, so you're talking about antagonism, protagonism, and sidekick, and how it all fits together to really drive a good story. We talked about how there's yes and. Sometimes this can almost be taken to heart too deeply in a way that hinders what we're doing with our improv, trying to drive depth through character. Outside of this yes and discussion, do you think that 
we are missing things in our training or that we're teaching the wrong things. What's your approach? I always take what I learned and when I push it forward and give it to others, I like to show the different concepts and angles, but then I make people make their own decisions because some of the theories are not going together. So right. what then? Who's right? No one is right. No one is wrong. It's what you're going to do with it. For example, I think that there is some danger in taking the rules literally. Even with yes and, if someone tells you, give me a blowjob, then do you have to say yes and? Mm. No, God, no. It's just that sometimes people in the workshops get scared to say no to an offer. And that's just one example. Yeah, it was also a really good example for on stage and off stage. Exactly. And it's very important to teach people to be safe on stage and make your own choices and decisions and to show them that it's just improv. Sometimes we get so involved and excited and so in love with the art form, then we lose ourselves. We may harm ourselves or someone can harm us, usually not intentionally. If mm. someone is an asshole, then we will see that. But sometimes we cannot see that something hurts. Sometimes even the teacher will not see that something hurts you. We are coming to improv to learn something new and have fun, not to get traumas. Because yeah. there's so many things in life that we have to do that we don't want. Mm. It's not that place. This is very important to me. I think it should be more underlined that we have to agree as improvisers, not necessarily as characters. I teach these basic rules in the beginning. I let people play around and then I usually add little stars saying, and remember to use your own brain. You can take it this way or that way. Never go blindly. Always filter everything through yourself. One of the things that I also find that sometimes we lose on the way is our character as a person. It's great to be able to play anything. It's professional. But also, I sometimes see how we just strip ourselves from who we are to be the random improviser. Being truth to yourself brings the truth to your characters too. If I believe in something or if I find something fun, why not use that? You don't have to push yourself down. It should elevate you and not push you down. This is part of the interview where I would normally ask you for words of wisdom, but I think those were just words of wisdom. You jumped into my brain and stole my next thought, which I'm totally okay with. Do you have any other words of wisdom in summation that you want to add or do you feel like you just threw down aggressive of good content. <laughs> <laughs> I think that I would just underline something from this last part to have your own brain and filter everything through yourself. I believe that what's best for me is to learn from as many people as I can, then filter that through myself and do my art. It's not about following someone's path. Mm -hmm. It's about seeing the path and learning from it and choosing your own. Oh, I mean, yeah, I'm happy with that. I feel good about that. Awesome. Goja, if people want to take an improv class from you, see you when you're performing, or if you're going to be traveling around Europe at various points at festivals, buy you coffee or tea, I don't want to start an argument. Where can people find you? The easiest way, maybe not easiest with the spelling, but the easiest way to find everything in one place is my webpage which is rozalska.com, R-O-Z-A-L-S-K-A.com. There you can find all my social media links and the email, my workshop description, and some content like my new podcast called Creatura, which is mostly about improv. And yes, and there is a blog with some articles written by me or by my guests. And it would be easiest to find a link to my Facebook because it's my full name. So you will never find it just like that. <laughs> <laughs> that sounded very evil. Good luck spelling Polish. <laughs> yes. Good luck spelling Małgorzata Różalska. <laughs> You know how you can Shazam music? We need a Shazam for Polish. <laughs> I will put links and information below. So don't you worry about taking notes. All right. Thank you so much. It was great to speak with you. I really appreciate your time and energy. I'm Lauren, this is Improving the World, and there's more where that came from. Thanks all, bye.
Thank you, Lauren. <laughs> So, did you love the video? If you did, please say kind and wonderful things in the comments down below. And you can subscribe if you're feeling sassy. As sassy as my freaking hair.